Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you again for this opportunity to take in your word. We know that the word of God is sure. It's a sure foundation, Father. It is um, infallible and errant, trustworthy. We thank you, Lord, for the scripture and the prophetic word, which gives us comfort and confidence, Father. And Father, I pray that you might help us to understand clearly uh, the word of God this evening. Help us to receive with humility the ingrat the word of God, which is able to save our soul from the power of sin. Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles once again to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. And let's begin back at verse 15. Um, we're going to look at the context here and then read down through um, to verse uh, 27. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let him which is which who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to, to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant, those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world. Unto this time no nor shall ever be. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh will be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Therefore, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you before. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Clearly, we have an order of events in this passage, and this is very important because there are those who look at this passage in the book of Revelation as in the rear view mirror, praetorism. And uh, when you take a literal approach to Matthew 24, it clearly refutes the concept of praetorism. Nothing in history has happened like this. Nothing in history has happened like this. So we have the first order of event here in verse 20, verse 15. This would occur at the midpoint of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation. And as we distinguish the desolation of the future tribulation temple from the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in verse 3, um, or verse 2, not one stone will be left upon another, those are two separate events. Praetorism tries to combine them into one, but uh, we listed several contrasts between the temple destruction in AD 70 and the desolation, which will occur in the future tribulation in verse 15. So uh, we went into that. Then we dealt with the location of the Jews fleeing, which is Petra. And we're going to elaborate just a little more on that and move forward how the Jews who are in that area, when they see that desolation of the temple, they are to take off and run. They are to flee to the mountains. And verse 16 says, let then those who are on, in Judea flee to the mountains. We looked at the area of Petra as a mountainous region, and uh, therefore, that for several reasons, there's prophecy dealing with the Jews and safety in the area of Petra for three and a half years. And especially the fact that Christ returns to Basra at his second coming to rescue the Jews. Praetorism would have God done with the Jews, whereas as they flee to Basra, Christ returns to rescue the, the Jews and they're fleeing for preservation. They're fleeing for preservation, the very fact that they flee, uh, and God, God preserves them, indicates that this is not something that has occurred in history. So Jesus Christ comes at his second coming to rescue the Jews. We examined these passages already 
in Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, and Luke 21, 27, 28. Especially that passage when Jesus said, when you see all these things, look up, your redemption draws nigh. That doesn't sound like God is destroying Israel at that point. It sounds like God is redeeming Israel. So the praetorism certainly would fail at that point. Um, now, we examine this place, uh, uh, Petra, which is an, in the area of Edom. It's a mountainous region. Uh, you can visit that today and, and walk into that area. You go through a wadi about a mile or so long and into this open area. Uh, is in south of the area of the Dead Sea. And I measured the distance um, on, I think it was Bing Maps, and 165 miles from the temple to Petra. So it's a 165-mile journey that the Jews will take uh, all the way down to that area of Petra. Now, verse 17 says, let the, the, there certainly is a sense of urgency here. Those who are on the housetop, let them not go down to take anything out of his house. Now, certainly in our culture, we think, wow, what are they doing on the roof? Unless they're fixing it. <laughs> But when we realized the culture of that day, uh, they did a lot of things on the roof. There was a roof in Israel were flat. They were flat. And so the idea is not to go down into the house to pack anything or take anything with you. But when you see that abomination of desolation, know that persecution is right there. And Antichrist will try to immediately persecute believers, especially the Jews, here, certainly uh, during that time. And so it's time to run. It's time to run for safety. There'll be no time to gather provisions. Think about that. No time to gather food or to take with you on your journey. You just need to take off, take off and run. Rooftops in this region, region were flat. People engaged in various activities on their roofs, such as drying vegetables, chatting with neighbors, <laughs> talking with your neighbors on the other rooftop, you know, um, praying and the like. Uh, remember, uh, Peter was in uh, praying, looking out at the ships at sea uh, in the book of Acts. The roof was approached by an outside staircase or ladder, so it would take extra time to enter the house after descending. Now, here's a, a artist's rendering of what a Jewish home would look like in that day. You see the outside staircase leading up to the roof area and a lot of activity uh, involved on the roof. And so when the days were hot, that would be the normal place to go outside, uh, outside on the roof uh, where maybe you can catch a breeze or, you know, take a nap like that one fellow was doing in the afternoon. Uh, but that was the place of activity, uh, the rooftop. And, and so the idea is, you know, when you hear about the abomination of desolation, um, you don't need to even go down those stairs into your house <laughs> to make provision. You need to just go down those stairs and run and keep on running. <laughs> Take off is the idea. And if you're out in the field, uh, you know, um, um, Whatever doing, whatever you're doing as far as, you know, uh, gathering crops in or whatever, uh, the one who's in the field is not to turn back again to even get close. Uh, once again, the sense of urgency here. People then in that day would rise at dawn, say some prayers, and start to work in their fields. As the day grew warmer, they would leave their outer garment at the edge of the field. This garment was essential for keeping warm at night. It could double as a blanket, and so important that it was the one item that a creditor could not seize from a debtor overnight. Yet Jesus warns his hearers to flee without it. Flee without that cloak. Life mattered more than even the most necessary of possessions. So even food and clothes to go on your journey, those would be ignored because of the other sin, the absolute sense of urgency uh, and taking off. And then those who are traveling, he says, woe to those who are pregnant 
and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Obviously, that would slow you down. <laughs> Being on the run, that would be kind of hard to nurse while you're on the run. You have to stop from time to time to nurse. And if you're certainly pregnant, that would slow you down as well as far as running. So uh, it says, woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies. It would be difficult even to navigate the mountainous terrain if pregnant or nursing a newborn. That would be tough if that would occur. Pray that your flight be not in winter or the Sabbath. Uh, again, we have to look at their culture. Winter was a season of rain. Uh, it's not necessarily winter as far as what's occurring right now up in uh, Nebraska and uh, Minnesota. I was talking to uh, Tom Stegall yesterday and they were having a blizzard conditions up there in Duluth. Uh, and my daughter this morning. So uh, that was uh, late, late in the season, but uh, they're having snow and high winds. So here are the ideas, uh, though in the land of Israel, you rarely see snow unless you're near Mount Hermon or up somewhere north. Uh, the idea of winter season though, would be the rainy season. And if you're going down a wadi, uh, you know, there could be easily floods that would uh, wipe you out. So you're praying that uh, this time of fleeing will not be in the winter, winter season, or on the Sabbath day. There were certain restrictions in the land of Israel even today as far as uh, moving on the Sabbath. You hear about a Sabbath day journey. You can only go so far. So here's a comment from Mar uh, Arnold Frutenbaum, and this is what he says in his Messianic Bible study collection. He says this, when Americans build a highway and come to a water gully, even if it is a dry water gully, they will still build a bridge across it. That's not the case in Israel where the roads are paved into the water gullies and out again. These water gullies are techni technically called wadis. Wadis. Remember that one I always, always mentioned that is the southern boundary of Israel, Wadi El Arish. That is the River of Egypt, uh, that is that uh, Wadi El Arish, it's not the Nile River that's mentioned uh, in the Abrahamic Covenant Promise. But it is a dry Wadi, but in the rainy season it fills up. These Wadis are all dry all summer and most of the winter. However, in the winter months, when rain falls in the mountains of Israel, water starts rushing down those Wadis or water gullies with tremendous force carrying tons of rock and debris, washing the highways out, and killing anything or anyone found in the way. When I was in Colorado, and, and they were torn, uh, I was torn a ghost town up in Colorado Hills, and we had to cross over this area, and uh, there was warning signs about, you know, looking out for the weather because that road could easily wash out just with flash floods as it rains up in the mountains and you're not aware of it, you're in that, that area, Wadi, where the water comes down and uh, could take you out. So you have to be very cautious of the weather uh, when you're in certain locations in those regions. Same with the land of Israel. Uh, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath day. The rains begin the latter part of, our, part of October. Rains will fall in November, December, January, and February. Think about why they go in the spring. Most tours to the land of Israel do not occur during those months. <laughs> and there's a reason. Uh, they will begin dying out in March and they will totally die out by mid-April. From mid-April to mid-October, not one drop of rain will fall in the entire country, generally speaking. It's a very dry season during that time, as Fruit and Bomb indicates. Um, and the Sabbath restriction would be a travel restriction that is not on force in the other six days of the week that poses a real problem to the observant Jews. Keep in mind the land of Israel. Does it mean that the, they're still under the Mosaic law, although they will impose that in a sense with the temple? This has a Jewish context. We have a temple. We have a Sabbath day journey, Sabbath regulations, uh, but... During that time, the Jews will be back in the land, obviously. 
And so uh, even today in the land of Israel, there are certain restrictions as far as travel on the Sabbath day. So for an observant Jew, that would be a restriction. Uh, in Israel, all public transportation closes down and no trains or buses run. Think about that. No public transportation on the Sabbath day. So that would slow individuals down. They would have to take off by foot and some, find some kind of way out of there um, by, on foot. Now, all this to say that this period of time will be an unparalleled time of tribulation. Unprecedented history. So it's connected to the abomination of desolation and it's connected to the Jews fleeing or persecution. So the then refers back to the events just mentioned in the context. So connect this period of unparalleled trouble with the abomination of desolation and persecution of the Jews. It'll be unparalleled in that period of time. There will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world unto this time, no nor shall ever be. And uh, there can only be one unparalleled, unprecedented time in world history. Think about it. If it's unprecedented, it means it, hap it, means it hasn't happened before, right? So think about all the trouble that the Jews have experienced over the years. And even in AD 70, there was over 1 million Jews killed. Praetors try to point that out and say, see there, that's the fulfillment of this passage. That's why they believe Revelation and this passage, Matthew 24, is in the past. But there were more Jews killed in World War II. Uh, over 6 million Jews were killed in World War II. And this time, there'll be even more Jews, I think, that will be murdered under the Antichrist regime. So this is something that is unparalleled, that has never occurred in the history of the world. When we look at the history of planet Earth, um, there, are, there will be no worse period of time. Sometimes we always look at the current age and we live, in which we live, and says, how can it get any worse? <laughs> we look, how can it get any worse? Well, we know what the Bible says, but the good thing is, by the way, is we will be raptured. We will not face the unparalleled time of trouble. But if you're not a believer, then you need to fear. <laughs> you need to fear because if you the rapture occurs today, then you will be literally left behind on this planet to face this unparalleled time of tr worldwide trouble. And uh, there are several things that indicate this. This is called a great tribulation. The Greek word, megos. We get the word mega, mega. A megos is an intense period of trouble. The word great means it's intense. A very intense period of time in world history. It's called tribulation. Philipsis is the Greek word for tribulation. It means distress that is brought about by outward circumstances. Distress that is brought about by outward circumstances. Distress or trouble that inflicts oppression and affliction. So certainly the idea of affliction would be the persecution by the Antichrist. That's part of this oppression. That's part of this infliction of distress upon the world that will occur during this time. Now, I think um, Realm Showers says this about this period of time. Those circumstances will involve Satan and his demons being cast down to the earth. Imagine that. We see in Revelation chapter 12, Satan is kicked out of heaven. He is barred from access. His access is denied. <laughs> access denied. And we see that because Satan can now approach God in heaven to accuse us. That's why Christ is our defense attorney. Satan is loose. Satan's not in some kind of hell, as you see in the far side cartoons. Uh, Satan is alive, Hal Lindsley says, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. And uh, Satan will not be bound until the millennial kingdom. And the church 
cannot bind Satan. You cannot bind Satan. You can resist him with the armor of God, but your job is not to go around binding Satan. It's a misunderstanding of Revelation chapter 20, which is future, and an angel binds Satan. So the post-millennialists like to use that verse to see, talk about spiritual warfare, and we go around binding Satan. See, your false view of eschatology affects your view of spiritual warfare, false view of spiritual warfare. And so they think that I can go around binding Satan because Revelation 20 talks about binding Satan. But that's future. That's a future binding of Satan. But in the meantime, right now, he is loose. He is loose, and his demons are loose. Uh, some of his demons are confined, certainly. Uh, those who sinned around the time of the flood, they're in Tartarus. There are certain demons that are confined in the abyss. They were cast out during the days of Jesus. Uh, but there are others, cer certainly, that are doing Satan's bidding that are loose. But Satan is kicked out of heaven, Revelation 12. And then he focuses complete attention to the events on earth. And he knows he only has a short time, three and a half years, to accomplish his deed and trying to get the world and then sort of trying to annihilate the Jews. That's why he goes after Israel right off the bat to make God out a liar because of his promises. So Shower says this, uh, these circumstances will involve Satan and his demons being cast down to earth, Satan taking possession of the Antichrist. He does that, by the way, at the midpoint when the Antichrist is assassinated and he goes into the abyss and he comes back out. And I think there would be literally an imitation of the resurrection of Christ. At that point, Satan will indwell Antichrist. And, uh, you know, you certainly have a definite change at that point uh, in, in Antichrist as far as his uh, rage against Israel and the Jews. So anti, this involves the Antichrist setting up an image or an idol of himself in Israel's temple and demanding the whole world that he be worshipped as God. I'm God now. Worship me. And so there'll be mass deception on a large scale worldwide at that period of time. In the meantime, there'll be unparalleled persecution of believers. Now, obviously, that doesn't include you as a church-age believer. You will not be here. So the persecution of believers includes tribulation saints, both Gentiles and Jews. Keep in mind the martyrs that appear in Revelation 7 out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation. They're appearing in heaven because they were killed. Unparalleled. Unparalleled time of trouble for Israel. Antichrist cannot, uh, cannot attack the Jews who flee to Petra, but they can attack the Jews that are around the world, the remaining Jews. And therefore, this is a time where God permits the, these individuals to be turned over to persecution. And this also includes the time of God bombarding the planet with various judgments including, I think, the seal judgments are over at this point. So we have the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, those seven judgments, and possibly the seven thunder judgments as well uh, during this time that will occur uh, in God judging the, judging the world. So all this is going on, and millions and millions, possibly billions of people will die on this planet during that space short period of time, during that short period of time, three and a half years. This is talking about the great tribulation. Normally we speak of the tribulation as seven years, according to Daniel 9, but here we have from the midpoint to the second coming, which would be a period of three and a half years. So this is a period of world history that is unparalleled, that is three and a half years in length. That's how long, that's it. That's it. And uh, it will be unparalleled. Now, where are we in prophecy in Matthew, in, in the Olivet Discourse? We're right here. Um, we dealt with the, the abomination of desolation. And this is the midpoint in those tribulation seven years. But here at the midpoint, 
we have that abomination of desolation. This follows the outline of Daniel 9. Uh, we have here this great persecution and betrayal, false prophets. At the same time, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to all the world, and then the second coming of Christ will occur. This, this will probably be um, a time when either the two witnesses or the 144,000 Jewish evangelists will proclaim the gospel throughout the whole world. So this is that period of time, the persecution of Israel, right before the second coming of Christ. The rapture is distinguished from the second coming. The coming of Christ in the air occurs before that period of time. The coming of Christ down to the earth to establish his kingdom is called the second coming. So those comings must be distinguished. And therefore, if, you're, if you get into post-tribulational rapture, they combine the two. But there's clearly, we will not be, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We will not enter one hour of that seven-year period, not one day of it. Um, God will deliver us from that period of time. Now, it's described also in the Old Testament as unparalleled. Let's take a look at a couple passages. Uh, this one should be pretty familiar. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah foretold of this period of time called the time of Jacob's trouble. We'll look at several different names the Bible mentions concerning this period of time. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Notice that. Unparalleled, right? None is like it. It is a time of Jacob's trouble. Didn't say the church. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. Very important. God's using that in Daniel 9 to finish Israel's rebellion. Keep in mind the sixfold purpose of the 77s of Daniel. It gives a reason for that period of time to end Israel's rebellion. Um, so the Lord will use that time of pressure and persecution so that the Jews will come to faith in their Messiah. And that's, that's one of the re purposes of that future period of time. So it's a time of Jacob's trouble. It's on, on parallel. But he shall be saved out of it. Notice. Uh, God's going to rescue the Jews at the end. He's going to be saved out of it, whereas I mentioned before, the church is kept from it. Two different things. We're kept from the hour, uh, Revelation 3.10, by the way, and the Israel will be saved through it, will be saved out of it, at the end of it. So there's a distinction between God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. See that? A time of trouble that's unparalleled. Same period of time. There can't be a different time there than Matthew's describing here. Dan Daniel 12 describes the exact same period of time. Exact same period of time. At that time, your people shall be delivered. Once again, God's not done with the Jews. God will deliver the Jews. That would refute praetorism, by the way. Going through this trouble is not God judging Israel. God's using this period of trouble to eventually redeem Israel. Very important. Now, this is unparalleled in uh, human history. Now, let's talk about praetorists, how they view the time of tribulation. Among praetorists, some identify the period as that of the Jewish war in rebellion against Rome. So some praetorists say, okay, this is about a period of three and a half years, not necessarily exact, proximate, from AD 66 to AD 70. And of course, it ended with what? The temple destruction, which in their mind is the second coming. They said, that's the second coming of Christ. 
So it's not a literal physical coming of Christ as the Bible teaches. It's a coming of Christ in judgment on Israel. Okay. Others say, well, no, this corresponds to the length of Nero's persecution of the church. And they hold that Nero, his name adds up to 666. And therefore, they are trying to argue that Nero is the Antichrist. But similarity does not mean identity. <laughs> There might be some similarities there in what he did, but certainly there's a lot of differences between when you look at the details of the events in history and what will occur in the future. So others, they say, well, this is Nero's persecution of the church. Well, these are Jews that flee, uh, not the church. The church certainly is not uh, the one being persecuted here, which began in their estimate AD 64 and ended with Nero's death, June 9th, AD 68. What's the problem with that view? You still have two years to the destruction of the temple. You have a, so you have a three and a half year period of time, but you have a gap of two years. You have a problem there. It doesn't fit the chronology here. If you look at Matthew 24, let's go back to Matthew 24. And uh, look down at uh, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Notice no delay. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, there'll be a darkening in the sun and moon. The powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. See that? Immediately after the tribulation. So if you want to take that three and a half year period of time, approximate, not exact in there, you know, Bible's more exact. It says 1,260 days to the day. You going to say, okay, that's kind of about a period of three and a half years of, you know, the uh, Jewish wars. Uh, and you want to end it on June 9th, 8068, your second coming is the destruction of the temple and you still have a couple years left. And it says immediately after the tribulation of, the, of those days is the second coming. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. And the problem is you have the reverse order, by the way. The abomination occurs first, then the Christians flee, and then the second coming. And they're trying to merge the abomination of desolation and the second coming, and it just, it, it doesn't fit. It really, praetorism does not fit the evidence of scripture. It falls short. And there's so many people that are suckered into praetorism and mainly Reformed theology. R.C. Sproul, for instance, one individual. Gentry, another individual who's a praetorist. There's partial praetorist and full praetorist. Full praetorism is heresy because they believe that there is no future second coming and therefore no future resurrection. If everything's in the view, rear view mirror in the book of Revelation, that means there's no second coming and no resurrection. And that's heresy. There are some who eventually held to moderate praetorism and obviously shifted to full praetorism to be consistent. And then they jump into heresy at that point. It's a dangerous doctrine. It undermines a believer's assurance. It undermines a believer's confidence. The rapture can occur at any moment. The Lord's coming to rescue us and deliver us from that hour of trouble. Uh, the Bible gives us hope. So, you know, the details do not fit. Now, here is the, the outline that Dan Matthew follows. Here's another thing that just boggles my mind. <laughs> um, get frustrated with so-called scholars um, who try to deny the accuracy of the word of God. And, um, you know, it's clearly exact in the period of time mentioned here. And by the way, only a dispensational view holds to a literal 183,808 days from here to here and a literal future seven-year period. No other system does. You know, why do I believe in dispensational theology? Because we take the Bible seriously at its word. All the others, oh, it's approximate, it's about, well, you know, okay. It's pretty precise here in the chronology. So we have a future period of time 
And then we have half the period of time described this way. It's described as a half of a, a, a unit of seven, which is three and a half. It's described as time times and half a time. So it's described as a half week or half seven in Daniel 9, 27. It's described this three and a half year period of time, described as a time, time, and half a time. Daniel 7, 25, Daniel 12, 7, and Revelation 12, 4. It's described by 1,260 days. Now, not 1,261, not 1,259. I mean, if you're going to use figurative language, why choose 1,260 days equaling, by the way, 42 months? Now, Praetors say, okay, I can find this kind of Jewish wars and trying to fit a 42-month period, but they cannot fit 1,260 days exactly. They cannot in their system. It fails. And the Bible's pretty clear. All these are synonymous terms for that second half. 42 months, Revelation 11, 2, Revelation 13, verse 5. So those are exact phrases that describe that same period of time, that time of unparalleled trouble called the Great Tribulation, half of that last seven of Daniel 70 at 7. And, by the way, Daniel 70 at 7, just to review, will accomplish six things. Six things by the time those 77s have run their course, including that last period of tribulation, those things will be accomplished. These things in Daniel 9, Israel's rebellion will be finished. Daniel's praying about that, Israel's sin. Why they were in captivity for 70 years? Because Israel was rebellious. But you know what? God's going to allow a future 490-year period of time to end Israel's rebellion. Wow. Was Israel's rebellion ended in AD 70? You say Israel's judgment was there, but not Israel's rebellion finished. Israel's sin ended. Did that occur in AD 70? How about Israel redeemed? And I'm, I'm, I'm taking the, let's go back there to Daniel 9 just to review why this future tribulation. The Bible tells us why this future period of time. Daniel 9, let's look at that sixfold purpose. Verse 24, Daniel 9, 24. 70 sevens, that word in the Hebrew is seven. The week is seven days. The translators in the English said, well, okay, a week is seven, so we're going to put the word week there, but it's literally heptad, seven, in the Hebrew. It means a unit of seven is seven years. Seventy-seven, so that's 490 years. Um, Seventy-sevens are determined for your people and your holy city. Now, is that the church? No. Daniel's people, the Jews. The holy city is what? That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem, context. And then he says here to do what? Here's the purpose of those 77s. He says to finish the transgression. Now, if we study that, that Hebrew word transgression, he uses that in Daniel chapter 9. Read Daniel 9, 1 through 23, Israel's sins. Daniel is rehearsing Israel's transgressions. Israel is in captivity because of their rebellion. But he says, this future, uh, this future 490 year period of time, God will use to end Israel's rebellion. An answer to Daniel's prayer, by the way. In Israel's rebellion, to make an end of sin, daily sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. It doesn't sound like it ends in judgment, does it? To bring an everlasting righteousness, was that accomplished in, let's, let's go back to the Praetorism date. Was that accomplished on June 9th, AD 68? Was everlasting righteousness brought in? Now you can argue that Christ died on the cross in AD, uh, AD uh, 33, and those who believe in him are righteous, but the language here is speaking of the kingdom. See, it doesn't fit Praetorist viewpoint. And then he says here, to uh, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal the vision and prophecy, fulfill the prophecy, and to anoint 
the most holy. The most holy would be the temple. To anoint it, not to desecrate it. Understand, to anoint it, not to desecrate it. All right, let's go back here then to our chart. Um, so, summarize the theology of this. By the time this period of uh, 77s run their course, Israel's rebellion will be gone. Why? Because they will look unto him whom they have pierced. <coughs> and we have the new covenant applied. National conversion of Israel by the time this period of time has run its course. Israel's rebellion against God ended. Israel will be redeemed. Messiah's righteous kingdom will be established. Israel's chastening ended and the temple will be anointed. That did not occur in AD 70 and it did not occur in AD 68. Sorry, Praetorist. All right, I'm being a little bit uh, animate this evening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The trouble that occurred in the first century AD was not the worst the world has ever seen. It's clearly unparalleled. And not just Matthew 24, but the Old Testament. We looked at the verses in Jeremiah, and Daniel says the same thing. And by the way, you have a resurrection, resurrection at the. Let's go back to Daniel 12. Let's look at Daniel 12. What do you have at the end of that period of unparalleled time of trouble? Once again, look at Daniel 12. At that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. We have a resurrection at the end of that period of time, which, will, by the way, would be the resurrection of Old Testament saints. Think about that. Did that occur in AD 68? Did that occur in AD 70? No. No, it did not. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together, trying to put three or four jigsaw puzzles together and try to make it the same jigsaw puzzle. Praetorism has a difficult time. They could be, it looks impressive. It looks scholarly. You look, wow, the Nero's this, da, 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 da. And you read this, a lot of similarities, but when you look at the details, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. So that was not the worst period of time in world history. Destruction, Reynolds Shower says this in his book, The Sign of His Coming. Destruction in AD 70 was not, the wor not worse than the Assyrian destruction of the city of Samaria. <coughs> Remember the, north, the, the uh, northern captivity uh, and the northern kingdom of Israel as a nation state in 722 BC, or the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, and the southern kingdom of Judah as a nation state in AD 586. It wasn't worse than that. Those were worst period of times in the past. But even recent history, uh, we'll see that, in, as I mentioned, in World War II, we have a worse period of time for the Jews than that. Now, Based on the writing of the first century Jewish historian Josephus, it is computed that 1,356,460 Jews were killed in the Jewish war against the Roman Empire that ended in AD 70. Now you say, wow, that's, that's unparalleled. But wait a second. By contrast, some 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. See, So they can put that impressive you know, number up there and say that was a tribulation for the Jews. But the problem with that is, though, when you look at those who flee, they're preserved. See? And they'll try to say, well, in Pella, the Jews fled. And, uh, well, that's not really the Jews. That was something on the church. And so the church was in Pella, and that's the place where they fled. But you don't have a physical deliverance by Christ in the second coming after that period of time a personal deliverance. So they're trying to put the, some of the pieces of the puzzle together, but uh, they're missing, missing the, the point here. Now, praetorism equates verse 15, going back with our chronology in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation with the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So you say, well, okay, what was that abomination? And that was the same as Jesus, what Jesus was saying not stone was left upon, one stone left upon another. That, 
He, she, they said, well, that's in the past. Well, the problem is, though, here it's reversed. If they had the second coming as a destruction of the temple, Christ coming in judgment, but at the same time, it's in verse 15, I mean, you can't make those two period of times, especially when you compare Revelation 12, you can't make them the, the same thing. Those are two distinct things. You have an order. You have the abomination, desolation, the Jews flee for safety, and then you have the second coming of Christ, right? Preterism reverses it. They reverse the chronology. The chronology does not fit. It doesn't fit the outline of Matthew 24. It doesn't fit the order of Revelation chapter 12. Uh, so their chronology is reversed. They try to blend it all together. Another argument, by the way, uh, there is no literal visible second coming in eighty seventy. That's why they had to spiritualize it. That was God's coming in judgment. They'll try to use some of the Old, Old Testament language about God riding on the clouds in judgment, and they'll try to use that to argue, see, this is God judging Israel. That's the language that's used of God judging Israel. But you know what? When you look at the coming of Christ in this passage, you see a literal, physical, visible coming of Christ. Not simply a coming in judgment, a literal, visible, physical appearance of Christ. And the evidence is this. Second coming will be visible to all. Look at Revelation 1.7. Revelation 1.7. He says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The Jews. Uh, every eye will see him. This sounds like a visible coming of Christ. Clearly. Uh, not simply a coming in judgment in AD 70. And then all the tribes therefore mourn because of him. Did that occur in AD 70, by the way? All the tribes of the earth mourn as they see Christ in the second coming. Now you see that language in Zechariah and uh, the second coming. Every eye will see him. Number two, Matthew 24. Let's go back there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. So immediately after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. They don't take that literally, by the way. That's not literal darkening of the skies. That's a figure of speech, of judgment. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Uh, notice, the Son of Man will appear. Appear. This is a visible, physical appearing. As a matter of fact, if we go back to Matthew 23, let's take a look at Matthew 23, verse 39. For I say to you, you shall not see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, what kind of seeing is that in Matthew 23, 39? Physical, right? Why? Jesus is going away. He says, but you're not going to see me physically until the nation of Israel turns to faith in their Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is a physical coming. That's not simply a coming in judgment upon the Jews. It sounds like hope to me, by the way. He's holding out future hope, which, by the way, will is mentioned clearly in Matthew 24, 31. He's going to send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Those are Jews who are scattered around the world. He's going to gather them back. What did he say in Matthew 24? He said in his first coming, I want to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but in my first coming, you were unwilling. Guess what? In the second coming, they will be willing because Daniel indicates he's going to break Israel's stubborn rebellion. He's going to use that time of unprecedented persecution, unprecedented judgment, unprecedented peril to break Israel's stubborn rebellion and to have them look to their true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So these things do not fit praetorism. 
Um, another one, one more detail, by the way, when you look at the timing of going back here in, in the uh, notes, look, let's go back to the time of, I mentioned two dates, Praetorism take, they, they take, I think somewhere here back in my notes, the two views. No, I think I went past it here. But the terminating, terminating point, either AD 68 or AD 70 in their viewpoint. Um, where is that note here? Right here. Monk Praetorus. Some identify the period as that of the Jewish war and rebellion against Rome, AD 66 to 70. Other thing corresponds to the length of Nero's persecution, which is November AD 64. It ends with uh, Nero's death. The book of Revelation that records these events at parallel Matthew 24 is speaking of these events as if they had not yet occurred. So in essence, what Praetorism has to do is date the book of Revelation before the Jewish wars. And it doesn't fit the evidence. Uh, most scholars, uh, including a follower of John the Apostle, Polycarp, dates the book of Revelation, A.D. 96. That would be after the fact. Why would he speaking of the per future persecution of Israel, the future you know, uh, abomination of desolation or revelation, if he's writing in A.D. 96? So they cannot accept that date. Their whole system stands or falls on the date of revelation. And that's why Mark Hitchcock, by the way, who attended Dallas Seminary, and I was there for the debate in the pre-trip study group. You can go back and watch this debate. Uh, but he argued against, um, if he was a debating, um, so uh, Hank Kennegraff, the so-called Bible answer man, uh, <laughs> except in the era of prophecy. Uh, Hank Kennegraff, who was a Praetorist, and Mark Hitchcock argued that he wrote his uh, master's thesis on this issue, and he called the stake in the heart of Praetorism is the date. If you can refute the date of when the book of Revelation, the whole system stands or falls, it's out the window. If you can demonstrate the, the book of Revelation was written in AD 96, Praetorism is dismissed. So he debated that, and I watch that debate I'm telling you, Mark had better arguments. He said, okay, let's look at the seven churches, the conditions of, you know, when the earthquake occurred. And they looked at the conditions of Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches that he was writing to, the hist history. The history fit the A.D. 90s, not the A.D. 60s. So he argued that, and I could go into his master's thesis, but... Uh, you know, all his fine points of why he argued that the book of Revelation was written. It's important because we have this view that is sucking in a lot of people today and it destroys your hope. And they say it's the preacher of rapture that's doing that. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not sad because I believe Jesus could return at any moment. That does not depress me, <laughs> by the way. I'm excited. <laughs> That's the good news. That's the blessed hope. The Bible calls it the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it doesn't depress me at all, unlike what CNN would say. <laughs> There's this article trying to say that the preacher of rapture is like a uh, one lady. Oh, it's just, I was taught that as a kid. I'm just so depressed. I went, I was so fearful and all that. Well, if you're not a believer, yeah, if I'm going to face yeah, the tribulation period. But if you're a believer, what, what's there to fear? What's there to fear? Now, uh, so this will be an unparalleled time of trouble. Now, we're not going to get into all the details of this. Uh, but there are various terms in the Bible. And this is, I think, uh, March Hitchcock. Uh, Randall Price has done a great job, too, identifying tribulational terms. I'll just read them. Uh, I don't know if you can read that print. It's too small, but this is the Old Testament terms for that period of time with the verses. It's called the birth pangs, day of the Lord, great and dreadful day of the Lord. It's called a day of wrath, a day of distress, a day of the Lord's anger, a day of desolation, a day of vengeance. We read 
Jeremiah 37 is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of trumpet and alarm, a day of destruction from the Almighty, a day of calamity, the tribulation. By the way, Deuteronomy 4.30 is the first mention of a future tribulation for Israel in the Bible. That's the first mention right there, Deuteronomy 4.30. Uh, one of Daniel's 70 at sevens, a time of distress or anguish, the time of the Lord's wrath or anger, the end of his time, the time of the end, the fire of his jealousy. New Testament terms for the tribulation, day of the Lord, time of calamity, although I like the word tribulation better. I think that's an NLT translation, but uh, we read tribulation better term. Wrath, it's a day of wrath, uh, the, day of, the wrath to come, the day of great wrath, the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb, by the way, Revelation 6.16, a time of testing that will come upon all the world, Revelation 3.10. It's a great pre-trib rapture verse, too. Uh, those horrible days, a time of great horror, a great tri great tribulation, the hour of judgment, and a time of sorrow. And so the Bible clearly lays out uh, this future period of time as a time of unparalleled trouble that's coming upon the world. But the good news is that if you're a born-again believer, if you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, you will not experience one second of that seven-year period of time. You are destined for glory, by the way. <laughs> Those he justified, them he also glorified in Romans chapter 8. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this evening that gives us confidence, that gives us hope concerning our relationship to this period of time. We know, though, the conditions of the world are being prepared for this unparalleled time of trouble. And even at the midpoint, the intensification of this period called the Great Tribulation. But we thank you, Lord, that you have not you have kept us from this period of time, but you will use this time to accomplish your purposes for the Jews. And therefore, you will be demonstrated faithful through all this period of time. We thank you for your perfect plan throughout history. Help us to have confidence that even the details of our life you can take care of. You're so concerned about these events, you are concerned about us as well. We thank you for that, Father. Continue to help us to look forward by faith, your, your coming, and uh, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.